Hello once again everyone. This is session 9 in low pressure boiler operation training. My name is Ben Weekly, and I've been a boiler operator in northern Minnesota for about 30 years and have uh, given boiler instruction training for operators for uh, roughly 25 years. Uh, this is session 9 in a series of boiler training videos that I've uh, put together uh, to assist uh, people to obtain either their first license or upgrade their licensing uh, as they continue on their path and uh, their career in uh, boiler operation. <clears throat> the previous eight sessions has basically dealt with steam boilers and the operation, the theory, the fundamentals, the fittings, and all of that of steam boilers. Steam boilers are highly complex, and so a lot of time and effort has been devoted to those. This session is going to be a long session, and it's devoted to hot water boilers, or sometimes referred to as liquid boilers, because uh, some of these boilers can have antifreeze in them up to 40% or better, and uh, so there's more fluid inside of the boiler than just than just water. <clears throat> Some of the differences is <clears throat> between steam boilers and hot water boilers, of course, is the temperatures that they run at. Steam boilers have to boil water, so they always run at temperatures of 212 degrees or higher. And so steam boilers run at a higher temperature. Hot water boilers run at a temperature of roughly 150, 60 on the low end, sometimes lower depending on uh, your boiler, and upwards of 180 to 185 degrees. So the temperature difference is there. Steam pound for pound contains more energy than hot water. So the flow of water is critical to get the energy out there, get the water back to the boiler, get it heated again and back out to where it can do the work. <clears throat> now, some of the other differences is, you know, steam boilers are not filled completely full of water. They are only partially filled with water, just partially, because there has to be room left inside the boiler shell for the steam to accumulate and then go out of the boiler shell into the steam lines and uh, do its work out in the facility. <clears throat> so hot water boilers are completely filled with water. All of the boilers full of water and all of the lines are completely full of water. If you get air up in your water lines on a hot water boiler, it will become waterlogged, or I mean, it'll become airlocked in your fittings and airlocked air in your heating devices, and uh, they will fail to operate correctly. If you get water up in your steam lines, you get water hammer and problems as a result of water in your steam lines. So basically, in a steam boiler, you don't want water up in your distribution system. And with hot water, you don't want air up in your distribution system. So there are a couple different, uh, different uh, uh, distinctions between steam and hot water. <clears throat> now, when hot water boilers were being built initially for the heating of homes, the the old systems would use what was called natural circulation they would make use of gravity basically to flow the water as the boiler would heat the water the water would get warm or hot and would uh, it would lose density and it would rise in the water lines and go through the circulation and go through the heat exchangers to heat your rooms and so forth. And as the heat was extracted out of the water, it would drop in temperature and return back to the boiler by, uh, by gravitation. And so that was natural circulation. <clears throat> there was an open expansion tank that was up at the highest level of this system. 
and uh, nothing was pressurized. This expansion tank was just there in case water, they got too much water in the system, it could, it could go up into that tank. As it cooled off, it would lower back down in that tank. It was vented to the atmosphere. And if too much water got in there, it actually relieved the water out, out into uh, the outside of the building. So natural circulation systems were basically for homes as houses became larger and as there became a desire to have hot water heat in uh, uh, school facilities, hospitals, nursing homes, uh, manufacturing plants, that type of thing, office complex, then they had to use some means of forcing the water into those locations. Uh, natural uh, natural circulation just had some limits that couldn't be overcome when you got into large facilities. <clears throat> so they would use, they would use pumps. Uh, most commonly used with hot water systems are centrifugal pumps. And uh, as the pumps pump the water through the lines, there are diverter fittings that are placed in the lines to channel the flow of the water uh, up into the heating uh, equipment and then it returns back to the boiler. And these diverter fittings are, are placed along the supply, the hot water supply lines and uh, they divert a portion of the water as it goes along. Gotta remember that hot water or any water takes the path of least resistance. So there has to be some way to force that water to the point of use. Otherwise, it'll just go to whatever is the least area of resistance and circulate back to the boiler. Now, hot water boilers have to have some means of water coming to them. On a steam boiler, we call it the feed water system. On hot water boiler systems, we call it the uh, water supply system. And it usually comes in from a well or comes in from the city supply and it goes through a pressure reducing valve. You don't want to push water and have water go into a boiler at uh, city supply, maybe 55 to 60 PSI. So it will reduce that down to maybe uh, 12 to 16 to 18 pounds, something like that, depending on what your, what your system requires. <clears throat> um, so water comes in, it goes through a pressure release, uh, relief valve uh, or reducing valve, and then it will uh, go, uh, probably go through some type of uh, uh, check valve or backflow preventer so that the water that goes into your boiler, if that gets, if the boiler has greater pressure than the supply side, it can't flow back into the source of potable water or drinking water and contaminate it or poison it. So it's very important that we have that. <clears throat> Whenever I operated hot water boilers, I very seldom left the supply water in an automatic mode. I would usually add water to my hot water boiler system, which was a closed loop system and was not supposed to lose water. I would use, I would add water to it on manually. And I did that because if for some reason my boiler loop system or the boiler started losing water and I didn't know about it, I could lose all of the water slowly over a period of time. And if half of your system is full of antifreeze, which is expensive, you could lose all of that and have to replace all of that once you found out you had a problem. So you could potentially have an air handler on the roof that develops a leak. And if you're automatically supplying water replacement to the boiler, you could lose all of your antifreeze and have to start all over. In Northern Minnesota, that antifreeze is a lifesaver. 
because if you have dampers that break or you got to shut the things down and it's 20 below zero if it's just fresh water in there it can easily freeze up and damage your equipment and uh, it would become uh, uh, impossible to use it <clears throat> now let's talk about low pressure when it comes to hot water low pressure when it comes to hot water the pressure can go to a maximum pressure of 160 psi so the maximum mawp maximum allowable working pressure would be 160 many of you out there have boilers that have an mawp of 30 or 50 but there are some that could go as high as 160 and if you go as high as 160 you cannot go over 250 degrees fahrenheit so those two things play into hot water steam boilers the mawp is 15 and that's mawp 15 across the united states and many other countries as well make sure you memorize that figure so don't go, so you don't get that wrong on your boiler test almost every boiler test will have that and with hot water boilers it's 160 or not above 250 degrees fahrenheit so that's the mawp when it comes to hot water boilers there are several different types of hot water boilers there's the conventional boilers that use fire tubes or water tubes uh, so you'll have those there'll be scotch marine style or there'll be firebox style and then there are also in the last 20 years they've developed what's called condensing boilers and they're called condensing because because the products of combustion not the water in the system but the products of combustion that get burned before they exit the furnace before they exit the boiler the temperature drops so low in those products combustion that that the moisture condenses and forms a liquid turns back to water in a conventional boiler you don't want that if you have condensate in a in a in a chimney a masonry chimney uh, or other chimneys uh, it can that condensate can uh, combine combine with uh, the soot and so forth that's in there and cause an acidic uh, acidic deposit and, and erode your chimney and destroy your chimney when it comes to condensing boilers the 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 materials inside the boiler are resistant to corrosion from that and the chimneys or the uh, the uh, exhaust system on those are made of products that are highly resistant to that now <clears throat> many of the products uh, uh, coming off of the, the the condensate coming out of that uh, as it condenses it becomes highly alkaline so condensing boilers will have water that comes out that's highly alkaline and uh, it'll go into a chamber called a neutralizer chamber that's filled with limestone before it actually drains into a floor drain or gets pumped into some type of drain uh, condensing boilers in order to actually condense and make use of the high efficiency feature of that second stage on the boiler the return water coming back has to be generally speaking 100 uh, below 130 degrees so if you change out a conventional boiler and you change it to a high efficiency boiler uh, if you can't get that return water to come back at 130 degrees it probably isn't going to be giving you the efficiencies that it could potentially have if your entire system uh, was uh, was designed for that type of return temperature now we talked about the scotch marine and firebox and uh and the hot water uh, uh, water tube systems and fire tube systems there's also electric boilers out there and so electric boilers are nice 
if you are confined with space or you have to put a boiler in, there's no way you can put a chimney out and there's no place to store fuel. Electric boilers are nice for that. They're rated in KW, in other words, kilowatts. So one KW is a thousand kilowatts. So a 10 KW rated electric boiler would be 10,000 kilowatts. Uh, they operate and uh, use electrical uh, resistant heaters inside of the boiler water and uh, that's what generates the heat and that's what uh, gives you the hot water in those systems. There's also in the recent years uh, uh, some boilers that have been developed that are called tankless boilers. In other words, there's no huge reservoir of water. They only heat the water on demand. And if your facility is designed for that type of boiler, there are efficiencies that go along with that. So tankless boilers can be electric or they can be uh, fueled by uh, uh, propane or natural gas, that type of thing. Now, all of these burners, all of these burners in these boilers, uh, there's a couple different styles that can be out there of the burners. Uh, some can be tubular burners where it's just a round tube, uh, perhaps an inch in diameter or up to two inches in diameter. There will be holes that would be drilled in the burner or placed in the burner and the gas would flow up through that and burn in the atmospheric uh, level inside of that boiler and uh, heat the water and exhaust to the atmosphere. Those tubular burners, uh, uh, the efficiencies of those uh, are not the greatest. There's no way to, to uh, make sure that the air and fuel ratio is ideal for complete combustion. Now, if you have uh, larger boilers, most of those are, have burners called power burners. And a power burner has a centrifugal fan and it has a motor and it's driven and it forces air into the burner chamber and mixes it with the fuel, turbulates it and uh, ignites the fuel in the furnace chamber and you achieve what is called complete combustion. Not perfect combustion, but complete combustion. So you get greater efficiencies in, in that regard. Uh, some of the igniters that are used out there to ignite the fuel, once the main uh, valve is open, you have pilots, pilot lights, that would be a standing uh, flame there from either propane or natural gas. That would ignite uh, your propane, natural gas, or fuel oil. So you have pilot. Then you have some that are spark. The main valve opens and you have like a spark plug that energy goes through, creates a hot spark, and that hot spark ignites the fuel. Then you also have what's called igniters. And uh, <clears throat> igniters are made out of metal strips. And uh, when the, when the uh, valve is opened, those igniters have had energy, electric energy uh, uh, put to them, and they turn red hot or white hot and they ignite the fuel. So there's a few different types of igniters out there. Pilot igniters, uh, spark type igniters, and uh, uh, hot igniters. So uh, keep that in mind. Some of the different fittings on uh, hot water boilers, uh, let's talk about it. Uh, there are different fittings on hot water boilers than there are on steam boilers. You could have two boilers standing side by side. One could be, and they look just identical. One could be a steam boiler. The other could be a hot water boiler. The difference is the way that the fittings are placed on it and the type of fittings that are placed on it for controlling it. Uh, hot water boilers, the number one most important safety device or fitting is 
the safety relief valve. And keep in mind, these valves are called safety because they save lives. They have the potential of saving lives. So a safety relief valve uh, is rated in BTUs per hour. That's how they are rated. And they are tested roughly every 30 days uh, when the boiler is in operation. On, on steam boilers, this, it's just a safety valve, not a safety relief valve. And the safety relief valve uh, is different than the safety valve in that the safety valve jumps open, relieves pressure and drops shut, and is rated in pounds of steam per hour. A safety relief valve opens proportionately to the amount of pressure that's in the boiler and relieves the pressure or relieves that hot water out of the boiler system. Uh, the other thing that both uh, steam boilers and uh, hot water boilers have is, is low water fuel cutoffs. So I'll ask you the question one more time. What does a low water fuel cutoff cut off? Well, simple answer is built into the name of it. It cuts off the fuel. So if the water level drops too low in your fire tube or water tube boilers and, and the burner continues to operate, you can absolutely overheat and ruin your heat exchanger. And that in turn could cause uh, a situation where you could have an explosive uh, accident with your boiler. So the low water fuel caught off, if the water drops too low in the boiler, it will shut off the fuel and it will not allow it to run. So you have two safety features we've talked about, both a safety relief valve and a low water fuel cutoff. Now there's uh, several different types of low water fuel cutoff. One is the float type where you have a ball, hollow ball with air and it goes up and down as the water fluctuates in the boiler and it engages the switch. So if you have plenty of water in the boiler, the float goes up and it keeps the electric uh, current going to the, to the burner. The other type is a, is a probe type. And I could best describe that by just putting my two fingers down and if the, so long as the probes are down in the water, it closes the circuit and keeps the burner running. If the water level should drop where it's not supposed to be, drops out, then the circuit is open between the probes and the burner will stop operating. The other type that's out there, and uh, many uh, newer boilers have these, uh, condensing boilers will have these <clears throat> and that's called that's called a flow switch and the flow switch is piped down into the water line on the discharge side of the boiler and as the water flows through the pipe it it will close you can hear that it will close the circuit and allow the fuel to burn in the burner if the pumps were to stop and there was no flow, it opens it and shuts off the burner. So this, this is another safety device that, uh, that is used for uh, low water uh, control. So keep that in mind. These uh, generally installed, they'll have a directional arrow on them. And I can tell you from uh, personal experience that these can go bad. Uh, sometimes they are problematic and going bad. Sometimes it takes uh, quite a few years for that to happen, of course. But when they fail, they usually fail in the off position. So your boiler won't start if these go bad in most cases. Well, we have, we have uh, hot water boiler systems and like we talked about the MAWP combines both pressure and temperature. We have to be able to determine that what's inside our boiler. So what is on the outside of your boiler, usually high on the boiler and uh, in a prominent spot so it's easy to read, 
would be a combination valve or a combination meter rather. Steam boilers have steam gauges or steam meters that just tells you what the PSI of the steam is. Hot water boilers have combination gauges and uh, these gauges will tell you not only the PSI but will tell you the temperature of the water. So you have to be able to monitor both of those and generally speaking the higher your pressure goes the higher your temperature of water goes. So keep that in mind. Uh, combination uh, pressure gauges and uh, temperature gauges on hot water heaters uh, they are installed down into the water and if there's fluctuations rapid fluctuations in the pressure the needles on those gauges can jump and as a result the vibration can break the gauge so what they do uh, in the connection device between the gauge and the water supply they will put a fitting in there that has a narrow opening in it called an orifice and it restricts how fast the water can go and come out of the gauge itself. Those are called snubbers and they're there to protect the gauge from uh, destruction from vibration. Okay, the other thing that we have on uh, hot water boilers for control is the aquastat. The aquastat, aqua meaning water, the aquastat measures the temperature of the water and those aquastats will start and stop the burner depending on where they're set. Now hot water boilers uh, generally will run at about 140 on up to 180, 85 depending on the temperature of the air outside and uh, they sometimes will also be incorporated with what's called a reset control. A reset control works off of the outside temperature and will give you hotter water in your boiler the colder it gets outside. So if it's 10, 20 below zero outside your water in the boiler will be 180 to 185 degrees. And if it's 30 above outside, the temperature of your water might be 160 degrees. And that reset system is, uh, is placed there for efficiencies. There's no need to use all of that energy all the time because a boiler sitting there with 180 degree water that's not really needed radiates heat off of it and you have loss off your boiler itself. So inefficiencies can be created by having too hot a water when the temperature outside, of course, is warmer. Um, one thing that we do with hot water boilers on the four circulation systems is we have pumps, a couple different types of pump. One would be what's called an inline pump. The pump itself is mounted right on the water line and it uh, circulates and pumps the water throughout your system. Inline pumps are generally smaller pumps. They'll be maybe under two horsepower or maybe less. And then they also have larger pump systems that are called uh, floor mounted or base mounted pumps. These pumps will be mounted on a pad of concrete and sometimes set right down on the concrete uh, when the concrete is wet so there's absolutely no vibration when the pump runs. So two different types of pumps there. Usually they are centrifugal pumps and uh, uh, one is the inline and one is base mounted. Some systems, depending on how many loops are in their system, may use base mounted for one area of the building and an inline pump for another area of the building. Um, one thing that pumps need, and that's assistance with pressure in order to circulate properly. As water flows through pipes, as water goes through diverters, as water goes through T's and goes through coils and radiation, and as water goes around elbows and so forth, 
there's what's called static resistance. So for many average systems out there, you need at least four to five pounds of pressure to help that pump overcome that static pressure in the, in the system. The other pressure uh, that we have to take into account, and that's elevation. If you're pumping up, let's say you got a two-story building and you have to pump up to the second story. For every foot of elevation, you have 0.433 pounds of pressure pushing down on the water. If you had a garden hose 100 feet long and you stretched it in the sky and filled it with water and put your thumb at the bottom, you would have about 43 pounds of pressure pushing on your thumb. That is gravity pulling down on the vertical, vertical column of water. So pumps have to have roughly uh, 0.433 PSI for every vertical foot of elevation that they pump. Now on average, a uh, rule of thumb is for every story in a building, you want to have roughly five pounds of pressure. So if you have a two-story building, you would have maybe four or five pounds for static pressure and and two stories would give you another 10 pounds. So you'd roughly operate at maybe 15 pounds. Now, if you have air handlers that sit up on the top of your building, uh, way on the top, you have to consider that as a third floor. So you could have potentially, uh, uh, you would require upwards of 18 to 20 PSI in order to assist that pump in the circulation of that water. If you don't have the proper pressure, your pumps are going to labor and they will sound like they're struggling to pump. They will, they will whine and that's not a good condition. So if you do not have the right flow of water, you may have pockets of, of uh, unheated portions of your building. So keep that in mind. You got to have you got to have the right kind of pressure in your system in order to make it operate correctly. As the water goes through, as the water goes through your boiler and through your pumps and your lines, air and oxygen can be created and needs to be driven off and there has to be some place for that to go. So where does it go? If you get the air up in your lines, get it in your heat units, they become, uh, they become, uh, uh, bound up and airlocked and you have to have a vent there to, to air that out to get rid of that air you turn the vent and the air will hiss out and once the water starts coming you just shut it off and then the flow will be there but uh so what uh what is in our system that gets rid of air there are a couple different ways one is called an air separator as the water gets pumped out on the supply side, it goes through the pumps and it goes through an air separator. Air separators, different styles, but it'll spin or agitate the water and it'll throw the oxygen and air off to the side, accumulate in a separate chamber and either be vented or it will be discharged up into a compression tank. We'll talk about the compression tank in a little bit here. So there's also what's called uh, uh, scoops. There's uh, scoops that'll be, it's a device that's placed in the water line. As the water goes through, if there's air, excess air in it, it'll go up into this scoop and the scoop will vent it to the atmosphere. So generally speaking, once a system is put together and it's up and running, and the mechanical people have vented everything, there's generally very little problems with air. Uh, you could run into problems with air sometimes when you're adding water to the system because cold water coming into the system gets heated and when it gets above 160 degrees, it starts pushing off excess air, excess oxygen. And so there has to be a means to collect that and vent it. 
Let's talk a little bit about water treatment. We devoted an entire chapter to water treatment or an entire session on water treatment for steam boilers. Hot water boilers, water treatment is less laborious. Once the boiler water is in there and it's properly treated by your mechanical people, you just need to monitor it. It probably should be tested once or twice a year by a chemical guy and you may have to add some chemicals to it to control the pH so that you don't get too alkaline, alkaline or too, too uh, acidic. So the pH needs to be tested and uh, chemicals added to it as, uh, as your chemical guy recommends to you. The other thing would be corrosion. If there's if there becomes a, a corrosive type uh, materials in your water, you place uh, what's called corrosion inhibitors into the water system to control that. But it is not like, uh, like I, I've said before, with steam, the water treatment needs to be babysitted. In hot water boilers, it needs to be monitored and uh, not forgotten about because you can uh, ruin, your, ruin your water lines and pumps and so forth by not paying attention to it. So keep in, keep, uh, keep in mind a proper water treatment, pH and uh, corrosion uh, needs to be monitored on hot water systems. The other thing that we have with uh, hot water boilers, uh, as we do with steam boilers, is different valves. Some of the fittings and accessories out there would be check valves or flow control valves. On a hot water boiler system, uh, if the pumps were to stop, you do not want to have the water flow to go in reverse, especially if you have multiple boilers in your plant. And so if, uh, if they shut off the flow control valve, will prevent that from happening, having that water backfeed the other direction. Uh, there's check valves and smaller systems that do the same type of work. Then of course, there's balancing valves. And all hot water loop system have balancing valves, especially if there's more than one loop or more than one zone out on a loop. These balancing valves are generally placed in the return line systems on the boiler. And they're put there and uh, the settings of them are given to the people that actually set these initially by the parameters given by the engineer. So remember, water flows in the path of least resistance. So if you've got several different lines, loops, or zones out there, if you didn't have any way of balancing the flow of that water, it would all go to one loop and that's the only loop that would get the energy. So these balancing valves on the return line restrict the amount of water coming back from each loop and balance out the system. These uh, balancing valves uh, cannot be tampered with. Some of the old ones looked like just a shutoff valve that would be placed in a certain in a certain position and some of them uh, some of the newer ones have gauges or meters on them looks like different degrees on it and they'll have test ports some of them have a little tag with a chain that's numbered so they keep track of what the uh, what that particular balancing valve was set at if you ever for whatever reason need to shut off these balancing valves to use them as some type of isolation valve you need to pay absolute strict attention to where they were before you move them because not setting them back to the exact location can cause a lot of problem rebalancing a large system or Getting the balancing done on a new system on a large building can cost thousands and thousands of dollars. Keep that in mind. You don't want to mess around with those 
And if you forgot where they go and didn't mark it down, didn't do any kind of recording on it, you will want to go to your boss and say, we got to, we got to spend $12,000 to have this system rebalanced. So balancing valves are critical. Now there's zone control also beyond that. So a particular room might have like a thermostatic valve that was be right on the radiator itself. And you set that thermostatic valve right there and it controls the temperature in that room. Then of course there are modulating type valves that modulate based on a uh, 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 thermostat in the room. So if the thermostat senses it's getting too cold, it will then modulate the valve to open. If it senses it's getting too warm, it'll close it. Modulating valves give great comfort in a room because the thermostat is set at say 72 or 73. It will modulate that valve to allow just enough water through to maintain that temperature. That's the difference in heating comfort between hot water boilers and steam. Steam always uses a differential. It's either on or it's off. You can't modulate steam. So the comfort level of going from steam to hot water sometimes can be noticeable. Then of course, we have what's called isolation valves in our systems. In a hot water loop system, I told you we have to have pressure. We have to have pressure to assist those pumps. Now, where does that pressure come from? Well, there's usually a pipe that's piped off from the supply system or return system. I can't remember which, but it's piped into the system and it's a dead end pipe. It either goes to a compression tank that's hung up on the ceiling, or it'll go to what's called a, a vertical bladder tank, but it's a dead end pipe. At the end of that pipe, the water can push up into that tank. And when there's air in the tank, it pushes that water tighter and tighter and tighter. And that water is pushing and fighting back. I mean, the air in it is pushing and fighting back against that water, creating pressure on the water. So the more water that's in the system, the greater the air compresses and the greater pressure is pushed on the water. When the air in those tanks push down on the water, it creates pressure throughout your system. That's, that's what you need in order to have proper flow in your system. <clears throat> Those isolation valves, you can shut off your compression tank or you can shut off your bladder tank in order to reset them or do service work on them. Now, if you come into your boiler room and the burner starts, if the burner starts, and the safety relief valve jumps open almost immediately, that's because there's nowhere for the water to, to expand to. So what has happened then? Either the isolation valve has accident, accidentally been closed or left closed, or your compression tanks and bladder tanks have failed and they've filled completely with water. So there's no longer anywhere for an air cushion in your system. And so you'll get tremendous jump in pressure. Instead of being up at uh, 18 to 20 pounds or 12 to 16 pounds, the minute the burner goes on, it'll rev up to 50, 60, 80 pounds and your safety relief valve, of course, will open to keep to protect your boiler. So if the safety relief valve jumps open every time your boiler starts, you got a problem with your expansion system and you got a problem with the pressurized system on your boiler. There are a number of different piping systems with hot water. We have the one pipe system, which is a very simple system. And it basically one pipe system goes through all of your various heating units, registers, floor registers or wall registers, 
and returns to the boiler. Then you have a two pipe system. Uh, that's fairly simple. The water goes out, the two pipe system on the second pipe, it comes back to the boiler on the second pipe. And there's a couple different variations of that. One is a little bit better generally than the other, but you have the single pipe and you have the two pipe. Basically, most all of your hot water boiler systems that are just for heating have a, either a one pipe or two pipe system. Now you can get into uh, three pipe and four pipe systems. And I won't talk in, uh, in, at great length on that, but a three pipe and four pipe system is when you incorporate cooling into your system of heating. And so the third and fourth pipe has to do with generally with water chillers and that water, cold water coming in and using your system for air conditioning as well as heating. Then of course, in many places, we have combination systems out there. You might have a combination of a hot water loop system and a steam system. You could potentially in the same building have a steam boiler that, that uh, heats one part of the building and perhaps a new addition with a hot water boiler that heats that part of the building. You could potentially also have a steam boiler and the steam comes off the boiler and goes to uh, what's called a heat exchanger and that heat exchanger heats water that is pumped as a circulation into a closed loop system and heats your building that way. The boiler boils steam, the steam is fed into the heat exchanger to heat up the water that gets pumped out and for use for heat in your building. So there's a number of different uh, uh, combination systems out there and uh, some of you, uh, if you operate systems like that, you know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> now, that's about it from the books. But uh, I want to give you a little bit of a, a nugget that was given to me by, by a service, service person years and years ago. I had a hot loop system. I had hot water boilers and I was having some problems. And I always like to tag these guys around because they were professionally trained. And uh, in most cases, they were happy to show off their knowledge. And so I would get professional training from them for free. Not a bad idea, right? Well, this guy told me one time, and it stuck in my mind to the point where when I got done talking to him, I went and wrote it down. Then he said, fundamentally, if you're having trouble with your closed loop hot water system, it'll be in three areas. Either the temperature, the pressure, or the flow. Those three things. So fundamentally, if you're having trouble with your hot water boiler system, either got not enough temperature, maybe it's 20 below outside and you only have 140 degree water, probably not gonna be hot enough to do the job. Or you'll have not enough pressure. So something is wrong with your pressure system and you're not getting adequate flow into certain parts of your building because there's just not enough pressure there to assist those pumps. Or you will have a flow problem. You maybe have a valve shut off or a valve stuck shut so the water can't flow. Or maybe your pump, something's wrong with a pump. Uh, maybe your pump blades are wore out or potentially the, the, the connector that connects the pump to the motor is shot. So you have a lack of flow. So just remember that words of advice from a service guy that I really respected. If you have problems with your closed loop systems, it's generally gonna be in those three areas, either temperature, pressure, or flow. So hopefully you've picked up a lot of uh, good information today. Uh, this is session nine, which in the fifth edition book uh, of American Technical Publishers uh, uh, consisted of uh, chapters nine and 10. 
In the fourth edition, it was only chapter nine. Now, what I would recommend you do, if you've listened to this and uh, you enjoyed it and you're serious about boiler training, make sure you hit the subscribe button. And, and when you do that, there's no cost to you, but a list of all of my sessions will show up. And then you can go back to the introduction session and find out the books that I recommend that you read chapter by chapter as I go through these each session, nice and slow. You can take notes and you will learn a host of information that'll be critical for you to be a safe boiler operator and pass your boiler exams. So the next, for the next session, which would be session 10, I recommend that you read the cooling section, the safety section, and licensing section of your boilers. If your boiler system doesn't use cooling, doesn't have a chiller system, you probably wouldn't be interested in the cooling section. But for sure, read the safety section and read about the licensing. And uh, we'll see you next time in session 10. Thank you so very much for watching and safe boiler operating out there to all you men and women. Thank you.